I'm going to do another dash cam review today. This is the Viofo A129 Plus Duo, which is another front and rear camera setup with a uh, dedicated parking functionality. Um, I previously reviewed the A129 Duo, which was the sort of old version of this. Um, and there is also in this series a A129 Pro, which is a 4K camera. This is a 1440p camera. Uh, so it's sort of halfway between the two in terms of specs, but it's uh, in terms of price, it's a bit lower. Um, it's uh, $10 more than the old A129 Duo at the time of recording, uh, but it's uh, fully $70 cheaper than the Pro 4K. So it's quite likely to represent a better value proposition, and that's what I'll be looking at uh, in this video. And I do need to say thank you to Black Box My Car for sending me this review unit to take a look at. Need to disclose that. Although I haven't uh, committed to saying anything particularly positive, as you'll find out. Um, and there is a link below if you want to use it to purchase something from them. Uh, if you do, I get a kickback, which is nice, but you do too, you get a little discount. Uh, and it doesn't have to be a uh, purchase on a Viofo product, or certainly not this specific product. Uh, you, you buy anything you like. On paper, the uh, Plus Duo has much the same fundamental hardware characteristics as the rest of the A129 series. Uh, the lens is a uh, f1.6 aperture. Uh, the sensor is a Sony Starvis chip. And um, it has uh, features like GPS tracking, it has a shock sensor, and it has Wi-Fi so that you can connect to it through your phone via the Viofo app and you can access recordings and things like that. Viofo advertised this camera in some places as 2K, uh, which I have to be pedantic about for a second in order to clear up any confusion. 2K is technically a video format very similar to Full HD 1080p, uh, which has a horizontal resolution of 1920 pixels, which is very close to the 2048 of actual 2K. Uh, the horizontal resolution of 1440p or uh, Quad HD uh, and what you get from this camera is actually 2560 pixels. So it's uh, more like 2.5K or 2.6K. And I don't understand why they under advertise this. Uh, better to stick to the 1440p notation uh, just in case you were confused. In the box is uh, most of what's required for installation. Uh, this is the long USB cable for the rear camera. There are some self-adhesive cable clips, a plastic interior trim lever tool, a shorter USB cable intended for PC connection, I think. And uh, then in here is another long cable in, uh, together with a cigarette lighter power supply, which I'm not interested in using as I prefer a hard wire install. Uh, there are some spare self-adhesive stickers for attaching the cameras to the windscreens. And finally, Viofo give you this nice little SD card reader, which uh, I found quite helpful for uh, those of us with PCs without inbuilt card readers. I prefer a hard wire install because it gets the wires out of the way, uh, but also because it's basically required for a proper parking mode setup because you need to supply the camera with both permanent power and uh, also the switched ACC or ignition circuit so that it knows when to switch modes. If you have to supply as an extra, which you have to buy separately, but it's only $15, so it's pretty trivially cheap, a three-wire power adapter kit, which does all this for you, and it also includes a voltage cutoff switch that stops the camera draining your battery while parked. So I'm using that in this review, and uh, I won't spend any more time on it, as I have a complete install video which covers all of this separately, uh, which I encourage you to watch if you're unfamiliar with the process. The GPS base accepts power and uh, works properly with parking setup. Uh, this used to not be the case with Viofo's older cameras, so this is an improvement. Uh, but it still does no pass-through for the rear cam, uh, meaning that the rear camera cable does still have to be plugged into the side of the front camera. Uh, which is just slightly irritating to aestheticists and uh, practically it's not ideal because removing the camera from its mount also means unplugging this cable. Speaking of the rear camera, it apparently now has its own onboard electronics and although it looks identical and uh, seems to give an identical video result, because of this change it requires a different USB cable which means for an upgrader from the old A129 like me, you cannot reuse the old cable. Uh, but that obviously makes no difference for a new install. 
As you can tell, I'm basing this review partly as a comparison with the uh, 1080p A129 Duo. And I'll show you some comparison footage taken with both cameras running alongside each other. The A129 Plus essentially has an upgraded resolution and frame rate, and that's about it, except for some uh, minor feature differences in firmware. One improvement I did notice is that the uh, Plus does boot quite considerably faster from the uh, power off state. And you can see here that I have started both from cold at the same time, uh, but the Plus, which is on the right, has started up and is recording already about seven seconds sooner than the old one. Uh, that's quite significant, I think. A129 Plus footage in this review is uh, at the headline resolution of uh, 1440p 60 front and uh, 1080p 30 rear. Uh, it has wide dynamic range on, which basically reduces the picture's contrast to keep detail in uh, both the under and overexposed areas of the picture. And I have a uh, CPL polarizing filter on the front, uh, but not on the rear. The recorded video is H.264 encoding, and I always set the bitrate to the maximum for the purposes of quality. Uh, this camera has no true support for H.265 still, which is disappointing. Uh, I know about the secret H.265 option, but it's not a practical setting for various reasons, so I'm disregarding it. Uh, so those videos are encoded at about uh, 26 or 27 uh, megabits per second for the front camera, which gives recording files that are about uh, 200 megabytes per minute, and the 1080 uh, rear camera is obviously less at about 22 or 23 megabits per second, uh, which gives files about 170 megabytes per minute. And this is a respectable bitrate, but I really wish it was available in H.265, as it would give a nice boost to quality for the same rate, uh, or allow smaller files. In comparison, I'll uh, just put up the two cameras side by side here, new and old. And uh, by the way, this video is produced at the native resolution of the A129+. Plus. So if you have a screen that can display 1440 or better, then you'll see every pixel, uh, and I'll enlarge the 1080 video so that it's the same size. Uh, but it doesn't really matter because the 1440p footage is noticeably sharper, uh, even when reduced to 1080. Uh, I notice that as I still only have a 1080 monitor, uh, so there is a real difference in detail captured. Uh, you should be able to see the difference even on a 1080 screen here. For the rear cameras in comparison, which are both the same, in terms of detail, they're clearly the same, but the processing applied to the video is clearly quite different, as you can see here. The plus is being given a much more aggressive, contrasty look. And remember, this is with uh, WDR, Wide Dynamic Range, enabled. Uh, I think this is just a product of firmware, so it's possible that VFO, VFO may continue to tweak both of these cameras' picture settings into the future. Back to the front, uh, this is overcast lighting in a slightly damp weather, and you'll again see the difference in sharpness. However, the extra detail in the picture is not enough to overcome the laws of physics, and you do still get motion blur in the picture once the light is reduced and the camera starts upping its exposure time. The 1.6 lens speed is good, but it could still be better. As you see, the paused frames here are not resolvable into you know, readable license plates uh, that are moving past, for example. In darker light, these issues all just uh, get worse. But to be fair, you know that's expected with any dash cam, really. And it's not like you could read license plates on moving cars with the naked eye at, at, at night, either. What I have noticed with the Plus is the uh, front camera is quite noisy. There's a lot more digital noise in the black areas of the picture. Now, I'm not sure if that's uh, just native to the different uh, Sony sensor or if it's a product of software, but since we're not talking about some camera for you know actual photography, it doesn't really matter, so long as the detail is retained in there where it needs to be. And the rear camera doesn't seem to suffer from this, uh, and again, you can see the slightly more contrasty processing of its picture here. At night, in proper darkness, this noisiness is really obvious, and the camera won't ever record pure black as a result. 
So it might look pretty bad. Uh, it doesn't have great aesthetics, so you certainly won't be reading any billboards or seeing any drivers faces in these circumstances but there is still more detail in the A129 Plus picture here so just from the point of view of uh, dash cam purposes this is still preferable I can show you this point about the extra sharpness uh, despite the noise here you can see as I overtake this Toyota on the motorway at the A129 Plus is difficult to read but it's uh, still clearly possible to freeze the frame and get a reading, whereas the old 1080p picture is pretty hopeless. That's enough picture analysis, although just one more point on the topic of resolutions. Uh, while the camera is advertised as 1440p, it actually also supports a 1600p mode, which is not advertised anywhere as far as I can see at the time of production. It's not even listed in the user guide, but it is there. Uh, it's 1600p30, so you lose the 60 uh, FPS frame rate, and it's actually still 2560px wide, which is the same as uh, the 1440p mode, uh, and the same horizontal angle of view but it's a taller 16 to 10 aspect ratio versus the regular 16 to 9. So you're getting more vertical resolution. I don't really see the point of this because the usual dash cam picture is, uh, you know, bonnet or hood at the bottom and sky at the top. So a, a wider screen format is usually better suited for a dash cam. But I guess the situation in a truck cab or a bus maybe where the camera is mounted up high it might lend itself to this mode, you know, capturing more of the road closer to the front of the vehicle down low. Uh, so I suppose for those users, um, it might be a nice option just to have. Next, I need to talk about parking modes. As I explained before, for these to work properly, they're dependent on the uh, hardwire install kit, and the camera switches itself into parking mode when it detects the ACC or ignition circuit being turned off, and then back into driving mode when uh, the opposite. Uh, then there are three different modes of operation that you can choose from. The first and uh, perhaps most interesting mode on paper is buffered parking mode or uh, auto event detection, which is where the camera runs all the time, but it doesn't uh, write its recording to the memory card unless it detects a change in the scene uh, looking for motion. And then it writes a 45 second clip to the card where the event uh, is placed approximately in the middle of that clip. And then you can look through the card after the fact, and uh, you can see uh, all the little recordings where the camera's detected motion. Now, that sounds good on paper. In reality, uh, in the real world, when you go out and you place a camera or two cameras pointing in opposite directions in random places outdoors, like on the side of the street, wherever you may be parking your car, what you find is that there is usually just unending motion. There's always something. Uh, and therefore the uh, camera will be constantly be being triggered. You can adjust the sensitivity of that trigger. You can set it to low, medium or high. Uh, if you set it to high, it's going to be going off all the time. If you set it to low, then not so much, but then you, know, you may miss some things. This mode might work for some people in some circumstances. For example, if you keep your car in a uh, locked garage overnight, and then you keep it in a uh, you know, fairly isolated um, garage at work, all day, for instance, then it might be useful to you because the uh, camera is just staring at static walls all day long and any motion that it does detect might be interesting. However, unless you are in that group, I think one of the other modes uh, is actually more practical. Another issue with the buffered parking mode is re relates to the 45 second clip issue. And that is uh, very often you'll get some event which is sufficient to trigger the motion sensing and the camera will faithfully record that 45 seconds. But if, it, if the motion is uh, then, you know, sort of calms down, let's say, um, like I've moved into the scene here and now I'm just standing still, I'm not running around in front of the camera, um, you'll get to the end of the 45 seconds and then it will stop recording and you won't have anything beyond that 45 seconds. Uh, and that can be uh, quite a drawback and it's a drawback that the other modes uh, which record continuously don't suffer from. The second parking mode is called low bitrate parking mode and that is just what it sounds like uh, the camera runs all the time in parking mode uh, just as it would if as if the car was driving except it uses a much lower bitrate for the video encode much higher compression the idea being that when the car's not moving the scene 
as you can see, is uh, much more static, of course, so it can get away with that. Uh, but it nevertheless um, does fill the card up with an awful lot of files. So unless you really want like a, a high degree of uh, practically security camera footage, um, it's, I, I would suggest that you would want to use one of the following options. And that is uh, one of the uh, what's called time-lapse modes. Uh, you can choose uh, anywhere between, uh, I think, 10 frames per second all the way down as low as one frame per second. And that just records a long stream of video at a low frame rate, but it does give you a sufficient number of frames per second to identify anybody who gets too close to the camera because you can pick out a still image. When you play those uh, frames back, you get a uh, time-lapse effect. If you just play the video back in any regular player, uh, it'll play it fast. So if it's set to 10 frames per second, it's going to play it back as if it were 30, right? Or 60 in the case of the front camera. So it would then play it back at six times speed. And uh, if it was recorded at one frames per second, it's going to play it back uh, 60 times speed. So it'll play back uh, one minute per um, one, one, yeah, one minute per second of uh, video. But of course, you can slow it down and you can step through uh, one frame at a time and uh, do anything that you like with the right software. And uh, these modes are really uh, my preference uh, after having experimented with all of them. Uh, I tend to uh, select the five frames per second mode, which is uh, what you're seeing here. And it gives you a good compromise between card space and um, you know, recording something useful. On the subject of the parking mode, there's also a parking timer, which I think is a great backup setting to use in addition to the voltage cutoff box. You can set a time limit for the parking mode to run, after which the camera will just turn itself off until the next ignition on. This means that if you're uh, only ever worried about monitoring parking, you know, while you visit the supermarket or mall or something, you know, but you don't need monitoring all day or overnight, you can set this uh, setting to maybe two or three hours, and this will further reduce the wear on your car's battery, while the power saver box will still be there as a fail-safe measure and you also minimize the clutter of files on your memory card. The final feature I want to cover is the Wi-Fi, which is uh, much the same as the older cameras in that it uh, runs as an access point to which you can connect a phone or tablet, and then you run the Viofo app, which connects to it and allows you to do a few things. Firstly, you get a live view of the picture, which is nice. Although I wish there were two live views, one for each camera front and rear, rather than it being the uh, same overlaid picture-in-picture -picture that you get on the camera's LCD. Anyway, it's useful in some circumstances. At the uh, very least, it helps in installing and aiming the cameras, for example. Uh, then, once you stop the camera recording, which you have to do manually, you can do a few more things, such as uh, access its settings menu, which is a touch easier than doing it on the camera itself, and you won't get a sore neck. And you can access and playback recordings, which you can also do on the camera. But obviously this lets you more quickly scan through files and it will give you the improved quality of your phone's larger screen. And then it just plays the recording over the Wi-Fi. Now it's advertised with a dual band 5 gigahertz mode as well as 2.4, but I found the 5 gigahertz actually appears slower and it was essentially unusable for recording playback. 2.4 seemed to be uh, just fast enough that it plays without freezing too much. I suggest that you uh, get this set up on your phone or whatever so that you can easily get it running if and when you need to, you know, say to show something to a cop. But the Wi-Fi mode isn't intended to be left enabled all the time. The camera records at a different format and bitrate when it's on. Uh, it draws more power, makes more heat, and in fact it turns itself off anyway after the next uh, mode switch or power cycle. Lastly, I have the bad news. The camera basically works and produces a good picture, so I don't want to be too harsh, but there are some problems. I should say I have flashed the camera myself with the uh, version 1.0 firmware from Viofo's website, and the rear camera has its own separate firmware too. So some of these problems may get sorted in uh, future firmware releases. We'll see. Firstly, the camera appears to be very sensitive to the memory card. I'm using a SanDisk 128GB MLC card, which by all accounts is one of the best for dash cam use. And uh, it was working just fine in my old A129 Duo. 
However, it gave nothing but problems in the Plus, even after multiple formats in camera, uh, until I put it on the PC and I gave it a full format that, you know, takes the sort of eight hours or so. And thereafter, it's mostly cooperated, but it's a pity that these cameras don't seem to have more robust file system implementations. Then, I have had a few problems with no recording errors. I had one trip where it uh, simply didn't record any front camera video for the entire trip of about 20 minutes. You can see here it was uh, working in parking mode at the front both before and after the trip, but they're all missing from this one session of drive mode. There was no error on the camera at this time, and I only noticed this by a chance when I was looking at the card later, and it's only the one time that I've seen this. I have also had uh, problems with the rear camera sort of dying and uh, stopping the camera from recording altogether. The rear picture disappears from the preview and uh, then the camera goes into its not recording beep beep beep. And uh, the only way I've fixed that is by killing the uh, camera's power altogether and leaving it for uh, a long time before trying it again. It's also uh, frozen a few times and required the uh, power kill to reset it. Uh, usually I think at this point it's uh, when it's hot. It's getting towards summer here and uh, even though these cameras have capacitors and uh, not batteries as on ba onboard power, which is supposed to be you know better for, um, for, uh, for heat, this one seems to have some problem with hot weather. Again, I don't want to be too harsh because this being an early unit, it uh, may be firmware or it may just be a case of a rare fault with this particular unit that's not repeated across all production. We'll just have to wait and see uh, once we get some you know, statistically significant user reviews start to come in. Finally, uh, on analyzing the 1440p 60 frame rate from the uh, front camera, I find that it drops uh, quite a few of the frames. And I'll uh, just show you what I mean uh, looking at this clip driving through this intersection. This is on a uh, 60 frames per second clip. And I'm just going to step through it uh, one frame at a time using the keyboard. And you can hear each button press is one frame step forward. And what you'll see is like there. See, I'm going back and forth here. So I'm actually changing the frame, but there's no difference in the picture until I go forward. And um, so what's happening is the previous frame is just sort of being repeated in these instances where it's being dropped. It's happening quite often. If you're selecting that 60 frames per second mode for the extra frames, then of course it is still better than 30 frames per second. It's not like it drops half of them, but it does lose quite a few. Uh, so it doesn't really perform at that full frame rate as advertised. You know, maybe you get 50 out of the 60 on the timeline, something like that. So that brings us to the conclusion of this review. Now remember, I have been reviewing a uh, version 1.0 firmware camera, so uh, hopefully any issues that I've discussed have been sorted or will be sorted with time. Uh, the value in this camera, I think, really lies in its price points. It, it has a very good uh, value for money proposition. If you wanted uh, better performance, like uh, 4K, higher resolution, then you could um, step up to the A129 Pro when then you would get that resolution on paper. But it's quite a lot more money to spend. And I think if you were willing to spend uh, that total amount of money, you might be better off selecting a different brand at that, at that point. But if you, don't want, if you don't want to spend that much money, then you know, down where we are with this camera, I'd say it's fairly hard to beat. Um, it, does, it does bring a lot to the, uh, to the table. So I am happy to recommend the A129 Plus uh, at the current price point or lower if it gets any cheaper, uh, so long as you, with the caveat that you're, you know, if you're happy to deal with any of those headaches that you might get as they arise. And again, thank you to Black Box My Car for supplying the review unit in this video, uh, where you can, of course, get the, uh, get the camera for less than the current price if you so choose, if you use the link below. All right, I uh, hope that was helpful. Have fun.